Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. We have a special show for you tonight. Many of our great global leaders will be here live to perform in a puppet show. They'll answer your questions, but their arms and legs will be attached to strings from the ceiling. And that's not all. The Red Army Chorus will drop by to sing selections from two Soviet operas, the Power Station at Vitesk and the Urgetz Dam and Tractor Factory. Very exciting. Not to mention an appearance by the incomparable Bruno of Vienna, who will lie down in a coffin on one side of the stage and instantly reappear in a telephone booth on the other side. Then he will take a common house fly, put it into a glass of water, and produce Stanford White. We'll see photos of Bogman, the actual non-decomposed body of a human being from over 100,000 years ago, excavated from the non-air-admitting peat bogs of Denmark. A medical team cut open Bogman's stomach and found that his last meal consisted of a sweet meat popular at the time, made from the pectoral hairs of the local mudwort. And we're going to try some of it right here tonight on stage. And we'll visit the Yako people of Guam, the hardest people in the world, ever since they managed to crossbreed with teakwood. Observe the precedent-setting wedding of a fish and a bird in the attempt to breed an entirely new species at the research laboratory in Livermore, followed by a visit to Dreamland and interviews with kidnapped victims who will tell all about their harrowing ordeals. So stay tuned, don't turn the dial, and now a word from Deerfield. Since the vital secret of winning is shifting at the precise RPM at which the engine power peaks, the new Deerfield 4X comes with a Darson Val precision jeweled self-illuminated tachometer that scans in just eight seconds. And that's just one of the exclusive features that you're not going to want to miss on this magnificent new high-performance automobile. So why don't you drop in at your nearby Deerfield showroom and let one of our friendly salesmen give you a complete rundown on the Deerfield 4X. The automobile that gives you the sound of power, the look of a leader, the feel of total command. And while you're there, you'll receive at no cost, absolutely free, a booklet that reveals a fantastic new method for increasing your height quickly, safely, and naturally. And a rapid-fire double-action 9-shot 38 precision machine from high alloy steel with a rifle barrel and a matted non-glare adjustable side channel. Hard-hitting, dependable, handsome too with a custom blue-black finish. So come on down to your Deerfield showroom right now. We'll be waiting for you. Now, the Capts were a very interesting tribe. They uh, actually had no, uh, they had no uh, industry and uh, they had no private life at all. Their entire uh, culture was based on capturing anything and anyone that they could. Now, because of the mountainous region of ancient Turkey, there were no other tribes anywhere available besides the Capts. So the Capts were obliged to hold inanimate objects uh, uh, captive for many centuries. They, for example, held rocks captive. They held trees captive. And for a while, they held mounds captive. Of course, the famous capped mounds of ancient Turkey, maybe some of you have seen mm -hmm. them represented in ancient mythology and in Turkish uh, mm -hmm. religion. Uh, and they were obliged to hold each other hostage. This, of course, led to the famous capped wars of 4000 BC, in which uh, uh, each uh, capped was trying to hold another capped hostage. Uh, this did not prove to be very successful, and of it, course, uh, you've seen, uh, you've heard of captions and captors and mm -hmm. captivity. Well, this is all based on the ancient caps, which it originally was spelt with a K. Well, what happened in this, uh, as a result of this internecine uh, warfare? 
Well, actually, very little happened, and they were eventually buried. The entire capped tribe was buried in an avalanche of earth and stone. No one to this day understands whether it was the inanimate objects fighting back or whether it was just a quirk of nature. favorite wrestler is Mr. Capital. He always enters the ring wearing a charcoal gray three-piece pinstripe suit, a blue shirt with a foulard tie asserted by a simple pin, the modest cut of the lapel offset by the sloping shoulders, two buttons at the cuff, and he carries a Crouch and Fitzgerald briefcase. The crowd boos. Everybody hates him because in the pursuit of profit, he forecloses the mortgages on the houses of poor people engages his industrial might in the most lucrative of the government defense department contracts, focusing on biological weapons, pollutes to the extent he can within the law, uses small tactical nuclear warheads to blow up schools of whales so that his ships can go by with skimmers and pick them up, runs training schools for torturers, supports the legal defense of the apartheid system and invests in South African currency, has bought millions of acres of American wilderness and converted them to enormous bauxite mines, negotiated to have the Alaskan pipeline diverted so that it would spill directly into the St. Lawrence and profited from the panic selling of homes along the shore, and purchased all the organic vegetable farms on Long Island in order to build a concrete theme park 17 by 58 miles across called Dreamland. In the ring, his gambits are first to provide his opponent with misinformation for an important presentation. Then he feeds him a supposedly hot tip, buy Spanish government bonds, knowing full well that with the might of borrowed money, he's going to cause the bottom to fall out of the Spanish market. If these ploys don't work, as a last resort, he has an accomplice place in the rubbing alcohol of his adversary, which is applied to his back, a strong psychedelic with a passing agent that is osmosed directly through the skin and causes him to be befuddled by the mire of his own wild and uncontrollable hallucinations. Every evening, Mr. Capital jaws at the track. He likes the sound of the cinders crunching under his feet, the breeze brushing his face, the way running seems to drive the voices from his mind and bring him to a feeling of spiritual well-being. His shirt soaked with sweat, he breathes in deeply the cool evening air as he angles off onto the sidewalk and runs along the road filled with slow-moving rush hour traffic, headlights glowing. He runs by mailboxes stuffed with evening papers. A pickup truck with two kids in the back, their hair thrashing in the wind, passes. The highway winds along the coast. He watches seagulls slanting in the wind, and he keeps on running. He turns off the highway onto a winding dirt road that burrows through a thick forest. Moonlight slanting through a web of tangled branches above him. He runs over a bridge spanning a stream with a banging of wooden planks. And now the road is paved and smooth and leads to the gate of a white, pillared mansion. He jogs around the circular driveway, orbiting a fountain. The statue of a woman with her mouth open and from which a jet of rusty, red water spurts into a vase below. The vase is cracked, water seeping through. The grass around the driveway is tall with scattered wild flowers, and Mr. Capital listens to the wind blowing through the foliage. I want it. I need it. I must have it. Give it to me. It's mine. And I want more. I want you to get on the phone and order some more, and I want it now. Then he sees a little girl rolling a hoop along the driveway by hitting it with a metal rod. She breaks into a big smile and laughing runs toward him with her arms outstretched. And he reaches out, 
grasps her hands and swings her around in the air, his eyes brimming with tears, when he loses his grip and she flies free and drifts weightless into space. And he looks around desperately for a way to get to her, for something to climb, but she's already above the tree line, floating higher and higher, crying pitifully in a small, terrified voice. And he can do nothing now but try to calm her, to comfort her. Don't be afraid, I'll get help, just wait. Everything will be all right, you'll see. And she drifts higher and higher until she's just a black speck crossing the moon. Then he sees a white stallion galloping across the field toward him. The horse draws to a halt, nuzzles him with its nose, and begins grazing in the grass next to the driveway. Mr. Capital runs his hand along its flanks, mounts it, and then bareback, he rides across the meadow and back to the highway. The town appears first as a faint flush of color on the horizon, and soon he's passing a string of filling stations and motels, and the highway widens onto a main street jammed with slow-moving traffic. He rides past squat, sagging buildings lit by the flashing marquees of movie theaters and the glowing electric signs of bars and restaurants. And the town is like an old, drab Christmas tree, with its bulbs flicked on. There are bums sprawled on park benches, limousines gliding through the rain. He passes trailer camps, bowling alleys, seedy hotels, slaughterhouses, pet cemeteries. Did you land the job at AJ&O? Get the overseas oil contract with the Omani Consortium? Make a killing with Moroccan bonds on the Spanish market? Sell, just in the nick of time, the condominiums on the Casta del Sol? No. I didn't. Up ahead, there's a policeman directing traffic. He stands in the middle of the intersection, medals, badges, stars, tin cans, and plastic flowers pinned to his chest. He has a nightstick, a walkie-talkie, handcuffs, brooms, mops, horns, whistles, bells, and a slinky hanging from his belt. He wears a peat cap with oak leaf cluster and a propeller on top and black shoes with orange laces. He's directing traffic, creating bedlam. Mr. Capital pulls the horse to a halt in front of him. I need your help, he says. You've got to come back with me. The policeman reaches into his holster, withdraws a gun, and fires point blank into the head of the stallion. The horse shudders, its legs give way beneath it, and it collapses. Mr. Capital falls with it, and his hands and clothing stained with blood, lifts himself from the pavement and rushes to the officer, screaming, What the hell is the matter with you? Are you crazy? Why did you do that? My God, you've killed it! You've killed it! The destiny of the American people is to establish a new order, to carry the career of mankind to its culminating point, to stir up the sleep of a hundred centuries, to confirm the destiny of the human race, to shed a new and resplendent glory upon mankind, the greatest, the greatest of them all, the Republican Empire of North America. Before the court, Mr. Capital presents his case. He says, don't look at me. I had nothing to do with it, so get off my back. I'm not responsible. I was out of town. Actually, I was laid up for a while, and I didn't do it. I couldn't have done it because I wasn't there. If I had been there, I wouldn't have done it because I wouldn't want to do something like that. And even if I had been there and had been doing it, it would have been because I was forced to do it. But I wasn't there. Now you say that a person who looks like me and talks like me did it. But I didn't do it because I wasn't around. I didn't know what was happening. They didn't tell me. I asked over and over again why, but they said it's classified. We can't tell you. So what else could I do? I wouldn't refuse to deny that I had dismissed the thought of not doing it, but I didn't do it. But when the verdict goes against him, he admits everything. Yes, he says, I did it. I don't deny it. I enjoy doing it, and I'll do it again. Hey, some people have to get paid to do it, but I did it for love. I learned to do it when I was a kid, and I've been doing it for years. 
I authorized the memo and signed it myself. I had it notarized and take full responsibility. I have no excuses. I feel justified in what I did. I chose to do it and it was my decision and I'm proud of it. No one else wanted to do it, but I had rank and funds at my disposal and so I did it. You came to the right place. The buck stops here. Of course I'm guilty. It goes without question. If you'd been there, you'd have done it too. In fact, you were there, weren't you? So punish me. I'm your man. And that's not the half of it. I believed in it. It was my mission, and in some cases, my emission, and in the end, my omission. And in fact, the commission of it was my will and testament, my last wish, my dream, the work of my days. The term jogging comes from the verb to jog. It refers to the jogging of the body that occurs with each footfall of the runner. The act of jogging is, in fact, like small pats of the Buddha's hand, each one bringing ever clearer light into the eyes. We jog ourselves free of everyday consciousness, free from the web of earthly illusion. Mr. Capital jogs in the prison yard, and he remembers a female runner he used to pass every day at the track. Whenever he saw her coming, he felt a thrill of excitement. His stride became longer, and his body, lithe and spring-like, moved forward with an exaggerated fluidity of motion, a slight smile playing over his lips. They'd stare at each other as they passed. Sometimes he wonders about her. One gains by losing, and loses by gaining. Great fullness seems empty, yet it cannot be exhausted. I will try to play my losing hand with assurance and finesse, so that it seems that every reversal is an advance, every defeat a triumph, each setback an invitation to further failure, always in retreat, never in disarray, marching down the hill, but leading from the front. The performance so persuasive, the illusion so complete, that no one will know that I am lost. Completely. by phone with California First Bank. Please enter your customer identification number. Please enter your secret code. Available account balance as of last banking day is $1.62. Please enter your next request. Kidnapping involves the robbery of not money, not works of art, but of human beings. It's an anti-personnel kind of crime. And it can happen to anyone. You just have to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. Say online in a bank when a gunman grabs you as a human shield and throws you into the getaway car. Or on a plane hijacked by terrorists. A few years ago, an office building was held captive in Washington, D.C. by a Muslim group. 
and eventually an entire city will be held hostage by someone with an atomic bomb who will attempt to ransom the safety of everyone. In fact, that's what the international balance of terror is really about. The presence of a nuclear arsenal on one side holds for ransom the civilian population of the other, and that ransom is met by an equally destructive arsenal on the part of the would-be victim of the abduction. Hostage taking is rarely done lovingly, say by a friendly, joking, avuncular, rosy-cheeked Dickensian old man who comes up, puts his arm around you, and seduces you into going away with him. But what we get instead are thin, swarthy, dark, feverish types, lots of teeth, guns, khaki, sometimes dressed in chador or black burlap, people belonging to organizations with numbers like M19. And they have a sense of purpose, of commitment, of moral certitude we wish we had, which explains why so many hostages eventually identify with them. It's a fundamentalist way of viewing reality, a world without confusion or anxiety. And these kidnappers show they care more about their ideals than most of us care about anything because they're willing to die for them. And in that way, I suppose they're admirable. But it's because they're fanatics, and we're not. At present, most kidnappings take place for the purpose of hostage exchanges. Let's assume, for example, that members of your group have been arrested for carrying bombs and timing devices, and they're languishing away in a federal lockup somewhere. And these people mean more to you, say, than the daughter of the chairman of the board of a major corporation. What you will do is seize the child and then trade her for your confederates. This has been done in Latin America for years. But lately, kidnappings have become so widespread, random, and cynical, as various groups vie for political leverage, that the situation has gotten out of hand. For this reason, an underground radical hostage hotline and exchange for revolutionary groups is being established. It's an 800 number, and anyone holding hostages can call it. For example, the IRA to say, we have two Bolivian colonels we're holding, and the Popular Front for the People's Liberation of Chad can call to announce they're holding the Italian ambassador to the phalangists in Lebanon, and a Canadian separatist, arsonist, and bomber group might declare it's just kidnapped the second political attaché from the Swedish embassy. And since none of these groups can actually use the hostages they have, what this organization does, it's based in Geneva, is act as a clearinghouse so that deals can be struck, trades made, and being Swiss, this agency is extremely discreet. And the taking and holding of hostages as a business has become very lucrative. In fact, in Paraguay, there's a futures market and exchange in which you can speculate in hostage taking. It works like this. If you foresee that members of a leftist group are about to be imprisoned in Manila, you can assume the group will need to secure a Philippine diplomat or political officer for an exchange. So what you do is buy futures in this category. And by anticipating the global situation correctly and knowing the dark horse, you can make a fortune. There is almost nothing that outrages Americans more than kidnapping. But people have been kidnapping other people for centuries. What is a slave population, after all, if not an entire people being kidnapped? Slavery is, in fact, the transgenerational holding of hostages. They aren't ransomable, but produce wealth in a different way, by doing your work for free. All you have to do is feed, clothe, shelter, and contain them. And the holding of hostages is, of course, basic to the way we built this country. Ostrowski lives in an old wooden house with rickety steps. He sits on the front porch next to a refrigerator. 
He smokes a corn cob pipe, whittles, makes hoops for children. He rocks back and forth. On Saturday night, he gets drunk and passes out under a street lamp. When his wife was 20, she was a hooker. Then she got extremely fat and became a great cook. Now she's 60 and skinny again, and her hair has turned white, and she's all bent over and given to saying wise things. And she's really good if you're in a lot of trouble because she's seen it all. They go to church. Well, it's not really a church, it's more of a conservatory. The first Baptist école de musique. A wealthy family brings them gifts on Thanksgiving and Christmas. Cast off clothing, malfunctioning appliances. Last week, Dr. Ostrowski went to the town where all the houses are painted pink, where the Chamber of Commerce is made of young boys, where all the buses have fists coming out of the seats, and there's no police force but a navy. And he went to a theater to see an old Joan Crawford film and ordered Over the Rainbow, a popular drink. And he remembered when Dreamland was just a Quonset hut with a styrene duck outside the door and the time he visited the Ringling Brothers' winter home for retired animals and saw lions and elephants on the beach wearing bathrobes and tattered slippers. Dr. Ostrowski imagines he's standing on a hotel balcony overlooking the desert. In the distance, he can see scientists in white lab coats testing Viking rockets. But the rockets are misfiring and they're exploding on the hotel grounds. He and the other guests are under siege. Beside Dr. Ostrowski is a tall, beautiful woman wearing a cream-colored dress and a wide-brimmed white hat with a veil. Do you know what I want you to do, she asks. What? I want you to shave off all my body hair. I want to look like a child again. Get the china bowl from my room, a shaving brush, and mix up some nice, creamy lather. While she kisses the top of his head, Dr. Ostrowski shaves her. Later, he finds himself in the hotel kitchen. There's a large wooden table and several women kneading dough on it, making bread. They're all naked and have flour on their bosoms. Dr. Ostrowski and a young waitress, a blonde in a short skirt, high heel shoes, and wearing sunglasses in the shape of hearts, go out into the garden. The girl tells Dr. Ostrowski that prayers are necessary before making love, just as saying grace is necessary before meals. He watches her praying and feels moved for her. Then they lie down together, but just before reaching his fulfillment, she pulls back and holds out a small embroidered handkerchief. Later, she folds it up and puts it into the pocket of her dress.